The idea man, that I want to communicate is wives need honor. But agape love means honor and don't expect anything in return. Dr. Tony Evans says loving your wife the way Christ loved the church isn't always easy or comfortable. Some of you are only going to win back your wives when you love them enough to take some stripes. Like Jesus, remember? We're following his steps. This is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. Most men don't realize that loving their wives is more about what they do than how they feel. So let's join Dr. Evans in Ephesians 5.25 as he explains how men can put their love into action by becoming godly leaders. I want to talk to you today about loving your wife. Paul makes a statement, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, that he gave himself for it. Husbands, love your wives. The word love today is used in a lot of different ways and it is used very casually. Uh, you may say, I love my job or I, I love chocolate cake or I love my car. And you kind of use it in movement and in flow because there is a general sense where we understand the concept, but yet the way it's used today is really not the kind of understanding that God would have us have about the meaning of love and its relationship, particularly to our wives. Now, it's a very critical concept because it is uniquely given to man. There is no Bible verse that commands a wife to love her husband. None. In fact, to my knowledge, there's only one reference, and that is where it tells older women to help younger women learn how to love their husbands, but no command. But over and over again, the man is commanded to love his wife. Now, the wife is commanded to do something, and that is respect or reverence her husband. Now, that is not a mistake. That is recognizing some unique attributes that belong to men and women that are different. A woman's greatest need is for love. A man's greatest need is for respect. And God recognizes that and has communicated that in his word. In the New Testament days, when they used the term love, they had distinguishing words. Words that differentiated the meaning of love so you knew what was being meant. They wouldn't just say, I love you, or I, I love hot dogs, or I, I mean, they had words that made a difference. We do not use those distinguishing words today, and so we use the word love to cover everything. So let me go back to the New Testament day and use the, or explain the three concepts of love that were uh, existent then, and those concepts are brought into the Bible. The first kind of love is in a word that was called eros, eros. Now, eros was sexual fulfillment, or to put it more bottom line, it was basically lust. So that when a guy said, I eros you, he meant I want you sexually. Uh, that's the kind of love that most of our music is made of today, uh, where love is used as a synonym for lust, and love is intricately connected to wanting physical contact. So when the Greeks wanted to express the fact that they, that they lusted, they would use the word love. But the word love would be a distinct word called eros that meant I desire you sexually, I want you to meet my physical need. Now when you think about it, that is a common use of the word love today. A guy in a parked car may tell a girl, I love you, therefore. And he makes a direct relationship between the usage of love, although he doesn't have a distinct different word for it, and his sexual desire. So that was one concept. The Greeks also had a second word, and that word was phileo, phileo. 
Now, the second Greek word was the love of friends. When a man said, I phileo you, he was saying, I am your friend. Now, the uniqueness of this, as opposed to eros, is that it was not tied to sexual fulfillment, but it did have something that was also true of eros, and that is, it was tied to some degree of selfishness. As in Eros, there was a desire to have one's physical needs met. In Phileo, there was a response to a person because of how they treated you and they were your friends. In other words, um, a Phileo is someone who's like a brother to you. He, he covers your back and you cover his back. Uh, uh, he's your buddy. You know you can count on him and you know that... Uh, He's going to treat you right, and you're going to treat him right. So that if you have a phileo relationship, and he doesn't treat you right, you will say, I thought you were my friend. That's phileo. It was that mutual friendship that had an understanding about it, that I'm going to treat you right, and you're going to treat me right. As long as you treat me right, I'm going to treat you right. If you stop treating me right, then our friendship will be in jeopardy because I won't trust you anymore. Okay? So that was phileo. That was a legitimate term used among friends. In fact, Jesus used it with Peter when he said, are you my friend? And the Greek word uh, is phileo. Are you my friend? Now, there's another word. This word is different than the other two because it expresses God's love. It defines love from God's perspective. And that word was agape. Agape. Now the reason I'm taking this time out is because before I can talk about loving your wife, we've got to know what we're meaning by love. Because I've tried to establish love can mean different things to different people. Agape is unique. Because unlike eros and unlike phileo, agape has nothing to do with what the other person does. Eros is tied to meeting my needs sexually. Phileo is tied to how you're treating me as a friend. But this word agape is unlike the other two because it had to do with taking the initiative to act on someone else's behalf even at your own expense. Now follow that. Agape is different because it had to do with acting on someone else's behalf for the betterment of another without any necessary demand or expectation for anything in return. Now let me go back to my original scripture. What I quoted, Paul says, husbands, agape your wives. Not husbands, eros your wives. Look at them as sexual objects. Not husbands, phileo your wives. Necessarily defining them as friends. Husbands, agape your wives. That's the Greek term. We would use love and perhaps it would cover all three. Can't do that in the New Testament. It's a specific term. When you look at your wife, agape them. That is, love them in such a way that your area orientation is to meet their need. Listen to this. Regardless of what you receive in Return. Now that's going to change a whole lot of homes right there. Right there. Because many of the problems that we have with our wives is tied to the fact that they do not phileo us. Or could be tied to the fact that they do not eros us. All right? Okay. I mean, it could be either way. <laughs> but the idea... The idea, when the Bible says love has nothing to do with their sexual response 
and has nothing necessarily to do with their friendship response. Catch this. Romans 5, 8. For God demonstrated his agape, his love toward us, in that while we were yet, what? Sinners, Sinners Christ died. God demonstrated love toward us that while we were sinners. Now, do you know how much God hates sin? You know how much God hates, uh, the Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. So he looked out and he saw our sin. He saw our evil thoughts, our evil actions, our evil attitudes. He saw our rebellion against him. He saw our lifestyles. He heard our cussing and fussing. He saw all of that and said, I hate what they are doing, but I will demonstrate my love toward you, even though I can't stand how you act, how you talk, how you walk, how you move, I'm still going to die. That is biblical love. And that's why you can love people that you don't necessarily like. Because like is phileo. Love is agape. That's why Jesus can say, Agape your enemies. Now, nobody likes their enemies. Nobody likes somebody who hates their guts and is out to destroy them. God says you don't have to like them. You just have to love them. Because love has nothing to do with what you get in return. Most of the world will reject Jesus Christ, but that did not stop him from loving, even though God knew that in advance. Dr. Evans will have more for us on the difference between love as a feeling and love as an action when he continues our message right after this. While most Christians talk about the importance of prayer, many would rather spend time complaining than actually praying. And even if we know how powerful prayer can be, it can still be challenging for us to do. In Tony's upcoming book, Kingdom Prayer, he'll teach you how your prayers have the ability to touch heaven and change earth. You'll learn how to make mountains move, break free from bondage, push through problems in prayer, and much more. You can pre-order Kingdom Prayer now before it's released and get it along with some incredible extras like free downloads of Tony's book, America, Turning a Nation to God, and the classic Answers to Prayer by Andrew Murray. And you get even more when you order copies of Kingdom Prayer for your small group or your entire church. Get details today at TonyEvans.org, but remember this pre-order special is only available through Monday. Discover how prayer can give you legitimate authority to invoke heaven into history. Start by visiting TonyEvans.org for details on Kingdom Prayer. Now let me look at a couple of verses very quickly in the book of John. John chapter 14. Verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. And again in verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the words which you hear in here is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Here Jesus says there is a direct correlation to biblical love and what you do. Biblical love is not discussion love. Biblical love is not phraseology that's been turned that's a good rap that sounds good. Agape love is always demonstrable love, for God demonstrated his love. You can look at Calvary. There's something to show. Biblical love always responds in action. When people say, I love God, but do not keep his commandments, the Bible says that's a lie. Because love is always measured in action. If I were to ask your wives, do you love her? Or you'd ask my wife, do I, I love her? The question is measured in terms of agape by what I do. In other words, if you were to say, I tell my wife I love her all the time, 
that is a meaningless statement for agape. Because agape is not concerned about your vocabulary. Agape is concerned only and always about your action. Agape is physiological and not just emotional. Phileo can be emotional. Eros is most definitely emotional. Agape is demonstrable. Now let's look at chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now, to lay down one's life for somebody is giving up a lot. I mean, I, I, I mean, we're talking serious sacrifice. To lay down one's life is to give all of you, because that's all you have left if you give your life, greater love. He's not even talking about marriage here. He's talking about the disciples. He's talking about you and me in this room. He says, greater love is no man unless a man would lay down his life for his friends. That's the ultimate expression of love. So what I'm trying to say to you at this point is for you to understand that when we talk at church, now, I don't know what they're going to tell you in the street. They're not going to tell you this. They're going to tell you, I ain't going to have no woman. You don't have to take that off no woman. I'm to take no off no woman. Do you know how many fish in the sea? You do not have to go through this. Now, that's what they're going to tell you in the street because they have a warped definition of manhood, okay? For a lot of men, the definition of manhood is the ability to score. In the Bible, the definition of manhood is the ability to not have to choose the score because you've chosen to be totally committed to one person for the rest of your life. That takes work. It's easy to find different women who are vulnerable. The hard work is winning somebody who can't stand you. All right? That's the hard work. It's, it's, it's not a lot of hard work to leave and find somebody who hasn't had to live with you yet. All right? And that part is easy. So, the issue that I'm addressing today is agape kind of love. Now, let's get one step closer to pragmatics. How do you love your wife? Well, first of all, how do you look at your wife in order for you to begin to love her? And then the last question is, what do you do to begin to love her? Well, let me talk first of all about how you begin to look at her in order that you begin to love her. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, which is a, a verse that we have looked at on numbers of occasions, but one that gives us some deep insight into loving your wife. Husbands, likewise. Now, whenever you read the word likewise in the Bible, it means that he's building off of something that's already been stated. And what he's building off of is the end of chapter 2, where it says in verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered. So some of you are suffering with your wives? All right, good. Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that we should walk in his steps. So before I go any further, I want to hear you talking about that was Jesus. If I was Jesus, I could live with her too. Okay? <laughs> I, don't want you, I don't want you talking that because he says that you might walk in what? His steps. So he's not talking about something that only applies to him, but it's an example for you and me. All right, now, he says, who committed no sin, so he wasn't guilty, nor was the seed found in his mouth. He wasn't lying. He was telling the truth about us, and he had done nothing wrong, but he got the blame. That was what the cross was all about. He took our blame. Verse 23, now catch this, man, because this is the introduction of husband-wife relationships. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, now, he could have said, I ain't going to have no human beings talking to me like that. I'm not going to have any human beings treating me like that. Don't they know I can cut them loose and find me somebody else? But when he was messed over, reviled, he did not revile in return. Well, no, what goes around comes around kind of stuff. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Yeah, treat me like that again. You're going to be picking your face up off the floor. Didn't threaten, but committed himself to him who judges rightly, who at the proper time is always going to tell the truth, who himself bore our sins. Now, bore whose sins? 
he bore something that he wasn't responsible for in his own body on the tree that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Now catch that. By the stripes he bore, we were healed. Could it be that the only way your wife is going to come around is by the stripes you bear on her behalf? Uh, watch it now. Jesus bore the stripes, but we get the healing. And remember that you might walk in his steps. Okay, now, let's go on. Verse 25. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. You were going the wrong direction until he bore stripes. But when he was willing to bear stripes, that's what turned you around. Some of you are only going to win back your wives when you love them enough to take some stripes. You're not going to hear that in the street. The street ain't going to tell you, you don't have to take any stripes. <laughs> Give some, don't take none. <laughs> All right, but now look. Now we come to verse 7. Husbands likewise. Like who? Like Jesus, remember? We're following his steps. Just like Jesus. Now what does he want you to do? First of all, Live with your wives in an understanding way or dwell with them according to knowledge or to put it more simply, study your mate. One of the problems in our relationships is that we give very little time to the study of our wives. Women are very, very Complicated to understand. <laughs> I mean, you say something and you want to know, what did I say to bring that kind of response? You know? You put your arm around her, leave me alone. What? I didn't do anything. You, well, you will never do nothing let you tell it. You want to know where in the world did that come from? Well, that's because we do not study our wives. And all of us are guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. Where we do not understand why they are the way they are so that we can't handle them when they get that way. One of the ways you love your wife is learn to read her. Learn what makes them tick. Giving honor to the wife. Give honor to your wife. The concept of giving honor is the concept of placing her on a pedestal. Like it or not, that's what that means. The concept of honor is placing her on, on a pedestal. It doesn't say change your wife. If you're trying to change your wife, you're messing up. You're messing up. Changing your wife is not by changing your wife. Changing your wife is by honoring your wife. It is you making her feel good about her. Okay? Women need honor. Dr. Tony Evans, talking about what it means to love your wife the way Christ loved the church. If you'd like to get the complete full-length version of today's lesson, it comes as a part of Tony's brand new 14-part compilation, Marriage Matters. Remember, if you contact us by Friday and make a contribution of any size to help us keep Tony's teaching on this station, we'll send you all seven messages in Volume 2 of this set as our thank you gift. At the same time, don't miss your chance to pre-order Kingdom Prayer and get all those free bonuses you heard about earlier. All the details are waiting for you at TonyEvans.org. You can also call our 24-hour resource request line at 1-800-800-3222. That's 1-800-800-3222. Tomorrow, more from Dr. Evans on loving your woman, including a look at the changes that happen when you do. Be sure to join us. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is made possible by the generous contributions of listeners like you.